Welcome everybody uh, to Authentically Engaging Community College students and alumni. Uh, I hope that you are ready and settled in for an informative hour with our partners at Onondaga Community College. And so as people are trickling in, uh, I'm just gonna wait a quick second to go into the next slide. Excellent. I think that we are ready to get started. Uh, good afternoon or good morning for those of you who are not joining us in the East, uh, who are not in the East Coast. Uh, I want to start off this webinar by going through some best practices. I mean, we've all been doing this for a little while now, so I'm sure that we're used to it. But just in case, we'll go through some of these. Uh, upon entry, you probably realize that you're on mute. Uh, we'll go ahead and stay on mute until the end where we uh, open it up for our questions. Uh, please do make sure that your camera's on. We'd love to see you. These webinars are a lot better when we can see each other. And if you just adjust your video layout to speaker view, uh, that actually makes it easier so you can see the whole uh, webinar while we can also see you and everyone wins. Um, now, if you can please uh, chat your name uh, and your school to introduce yourself in the chat, that would be great. And just one other fi uh, final housekeeping slide here before we get started. Uh, the Zoom chat, as you probably now notice, is open and it's going to stay open throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to add those there. Um, and if you actually would feel comfortable using the reaction emojis, we'd love to see those. You know, if something resonates with you, you want to give it a thumbs up. Or if you just love something that we said, feel free to throw us a heart emoji. We'd love that. And we want to just go through the agenda for today. So today we're going to be discussing student success at two year institutions and we're going to uh, have Scott join us here, our speaker. Um, and we're going to cover a peer mentorship case study with obviously our partners at uh, Onondaga Community College. And then at the end, we are going to leave some questions for or some time for some questions for you all. And now you've heard my voice for the past couple slides and you've seen my face, but I hope that you allow me the opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Yvette Delgado and I am a partnerships director here at Mentor Collective. And for the past two years, I've had the privilege of working with community colleges across the country. Um, and that's actually by design. I'm a proud community college alum myself. I attended Mesa Community College. If Mesa's here, hi. Um, I am a first gen low income Latina from the West Valley of Phoenix, if you've ever been. Um, and my experience navigating the complicated landscape of higher education left a lasting impact. And I really just vowed to dedicate my career to supporting other first gen like myself. So they don't have to face similar challenges to their education. And so I really do believe that how we support students like me um, can really make some of these challenges a little bit smoother that community colleges are facing right now. And I hope that today you can learn something from our webinar that you can bring back and make an impact on your campus. I'm going to be joined by a few other folks, my lovely colleague Lauren Harnett and Keisha, who work really closely with our Onondaga Community College, and you're going to hear from them a little bit later and they'll have an opportunity to introduce themselves. As well as our speaker, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Scott Schuer, uh, who is the Dean of Students at Onondaga Community College, and he'll be walking us through his vision for student success and how it's defined at uh, Onondaga Community College and the role that mentorship plays in that vision. But before then, I just want to give you a little bit about Scott. He'll have the opportunity to introduce himself in a little bit. Um, but, you know, we uh, well, one thing I want to note, actually, is that you will be getting a, a copy of the slides as well. So if you want to look a little bit further into Scott and his recent publications and presentations and a part of the executive leaderboards that he's on, uh, you will get some of this. Um, so you can feel free to try to connect with him or research a little bit more about uh, Scott. Before we take a dive into the meat of the webinar, I do want to take a step back to assess the challenges that community colleges are currently facing. I think that in order to strategically plan um, and, you know, we need to know, we, we really do need to know what's working and where we're falling short. And while we know that enrollments are concerns, funding challenges have always been there, where I want us to focus today is supporting students to holistically and, and really just keep that in mind as, as we go through today's webinar. 
which that actually <laughs> leads me to my very first question. And I, I want to actually welcome Scott to the conversation. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to ask this first question here, Scott. How, how are you defining student success on, on Adaga? It's a great question, but uh, first and foremost, just want to say hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Yvette, thank you so much for um, presenting this with me. I'm really excited to talk about uh, some of the engagement uh, activities that we have here at OCC. Um, so again, thrilled to be here. Happy to see everybody virtually. And um, so let's just jumping right in. So uh, here at OCC and myself particularly, uh, student success is not just academic success, it's educational and developmental um, growth and success. Uh, whether it's transferring to a bachelor's degree, granting institution, finding employment um, that pays a livable wage, uh, or just building some skills that allow you the opportunity to advance within uh, your current career, success is meeting the goals that you've set in place for yourself. Um, I like to add the developmental piece because there's a lot of student growth that happens um, at the collegiate level. We all know that. We all appreciate that. But it's something that's not often acknowledged when we talk about student success. When we look at um, data and analytics, we look at retention rates and enrollment rates and um, persistence patterns, so on and so forth. But to be able to talk about the student's developmental growth is something that I'm passionate about, I think it's in, uh, very important because you could graduate, have a wonderful GPA, be incredibly successful academically, leave the institution and not have the developmental, uh, not be at the developmental level to be successful when looking for employment. Um, here at OCC, we do use a holistic approach, um, very common within our field. We focus on creating a culture of care, uh, that culture of care has been well researched. Uh, there's lots of information about there about students not leaving the institution because the it's academically difficult. They're not leaving the institution because they don't feel that they can academically make it. They're leaving because they're facing challenges that are compounded by perhaps some academic struggles. They're facing. Um, as you could see on the slide here, uh, they may be facing some physiological or safety needs that need to be addressed before they could focus on achieving their academic potential. This slide particularly, um, I put together using some of the resources on the slide. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, very common. I assume many people are familiar with that. The benefit to what I do as a senior student affairs officer is really try to create an awareness by our faculty and staff on campus that academic affairs by and large, their goal is to see students' academic success. They want them to achieve their potential, be successful in the classroom, uh, reach their goals and move on. We have those same goals within student affairs but our focus is less about academic um, success at the forefront. We spent, many of us spend much of our time focusing on those base level needs. You're not going to be successful in class. You're not going to be focused on doing your homework if you're living in your car and you're not sure where your next meal is gonna come from. So that does not mean that academic affairs folks don't worry about the physiological and safety needs of their students or that student affairs folks don't worry about making sure that the students achieve their full potential. We all do both, but those arrows signify the priorities of each. Student affairs, in my opinion, works from the ground up. Academic affairs works from the top down. That's, that's so well said, Scott. Um, it, you can't, you just can't possibly think about what what's going on in the next quiz in math or if you're falling mm -hmm. behind if you don't have a roof over your head if you don't have food um, and those are all mm -hmm. crucial things that i think sometimes go uh unseen and unknown so um that 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 really reads leads me to my next question is you know if 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 student success tends to be sort of everyone's job but 
how can you reinforce that and how does it become part of everyone's job uh, and particularly at OCC? Sure, um, great question. It, it is not everybody's job to fix every student's solution or to fix every student's problem. You're not responsible for solving every problem that's out there. But as higher education professionals, our job is are to know the resources that are available on campus that we could direct the student to, to get them that expert support that they need. Um, I myself have quite a bit of experience working with counseling centers, um, behavioral intervention teams, so on and so forth. But if I know students don't need that level of care, they need more uh, assistance with time management. Uh, if they need assistance managing their um, financial aid paperwork and completing their FAFSA, I want to get them to the correct offices. The last thing anybody wants to do is to listen to me as it relates to somebody's FAFSA or financial aid. That is not good for any student. Um, I understand what my limits are, but I know that we have an office that has experts that will help the student manage that process. Um, from our faculty, we have um, individuals who, you know, are experts in their field, focus on the efforts um, that are taking place in class. When we have our custodial and maintenance team uh, acknowledging the work that they do that allows the student to be comfortable in a room in class so they can focus on the material being shared. If you think about walking into a classroom, if there are permanent marker scribbles all over a dry erase board, that the instructor walks into the class and they don't have the right material to get it off the dry erase board, there will be students in class where that is enough of a distraction that it's actually hindering their educational experience for that day. So making sure that you value your um, staff from top to bottom, side to side, and letting them know that what they do impacts student success. As leadership for the institution, it's my job to make sure everybody knows that. And as colleagues here on this presentation, it's your job to make sure that everybody on your team knows that it's everyone's responsibility to focus on student success. So you'll see here, um, we use a meta major model at OCC. That is where we have our academic programs clustered into different schools. It's very much the Oxford, the traditional Oxford style that you'll see um, used throughout the country. It's, it's been around for quite some time. And this model is uh, created in such a way where students are affiliated with each school, with any one of their uh, schools that are relevant to their major. They Within that school, there's a dedicated advisor, success coach or student navigator, school specialist, um, which is a position that focuses on student engagement and how that can be enhanced by faculty involvement. Um, these are our students' homes. We've created a culture where um, John is accepted to the School of Health at Onondaga Community College. We, you're accepted to the School of Education, the School of Business at Onondaga Community College. We want that to be your home identity because the smaller that you're able to make that student's um, uh, experience, the, the closer you're able to connect that student to those who could help them, the more likely they are to utilize those resources. Um, if you have a student who is timid and shy and not comfortable walking into an office and asking for help on a 2000 student campus, they're darn sure not going to necessarily feel comfortable doing that on a 75,000 student, um, student body campus. So the smaller the environment, the more likely we are that we're going to have students take that step, walk into the door, and ask for help. Um, that being said, all of those staff members within the school are actively intervening with these students. We believe in intrusive intervention. If we don't hear from you, you will hear from us. Um, every student is tracked. We know, um, we keep notes on every conversation, whether they responded to an email or not, responded to a text message or not. That culture where you're not going to hear from OCC as a whole, you're hearing from your school, 
has truly helped create connections between the student and the institution, um, although the institution that they realize is their school. I really like that, Scott, and I see how it's tied to what you just mentioned about, you know, it's everyone's job at OCC to be to be thinking about student success. And I see how these schools being sort of narrowed in and supporting and, and sort of circling the student of saying, like, I got you. Is there something going on? Here I am. If we don't hear from you, I'm going to reach out. And I think that's super key. It's not just super. Not, it's just not key for for you all, but I think key across the country, you have different cultures and you have different students who vary from level of uh, introvertness or, you know, mm -hmm. cultural, uh, cultural norms uh, mm -hmm. to be able to go and ask a student um, and, and support them. And that's, that's wonderful. You'll see here that we have a, um, a sampling of services that we offer students for us, these are those resources that I spoke to earlier, where we may, we may not need you to own the, the service, own the resource. We want folks to know that they are there. Um, examples that our staff often use to help break down some of those barriers that our students may experience are, uh, for us, it's Laser Success, a, a program based off of um, an early alert platform that allows us to have faculty complete progress surveys, raise flags, um, notify the schools that there's a, uh, there's a concern with the students. They're not in class. They did poorly on their first test. Uh, they, you know, they're having trouble staying awake in class. Whatever the situation may be, they're able to raise a flag and that student's home school, not the greater college, going back to their home school, one of those staff members will reach out and say, again, Johnny, I heard that you're having trouble in English 103, but what's going on? How can we help? Are you doing okay? Uh, and then really digging into why the student may be having trouble. Are there needs for tutoring or learning center assistance? Is it that they're not getting a good night's sleep because they're housing insecure and they're couch, couch surfing? So those flags and having the faculty buy-in to raise those flags is a critical component in us being able to intervene with the students early. I can't say that enough. Early intervention is key. Um, if we look at lagging data, if we look at data, and we'll get more into that a little bit later, but if we look at the data at the end of the semester and say, well, what was wrong with this population of students? Why weren't they successful? It's informative, but you've just lost that population of students. If we can get that during week two, week three, there's a significantly more, um, it's significantly more likely that we'll be able to affect some true change uh, in that student's life. Um, we have other programs like our bias response team, which is focused on community rehabilitation should there be an, uh, an incident of bias on campus. Our box of books program where students as part of their enrollment package, they get a box of books from Barnes and Noble. That program allows students to not have to think about walking in, finding their books. Do I need this book? Do I need that book? It's a flat fee based on a um, based on the number of credits they're taking. And they literally get a box of books before the semester starts. And it's here's everything you need for all of your classes. Um, and then of course, our Children's Learning Center for those uh, students who may be parents, having affordable childcare that's in a safe location where they could easily access it at a cost that is reasonable for them. Not only are there sliding scales, but a lot of the cost for the learning center or for the daycare access is offset by some uh, alternative funding sources, some grants, some uh, partners who are willing to offset some of some of that cost. So knowing the needs of our students, uh, laser success, there's some academic intervention, bias response, it's a, a significant community response that's needed, the importance of just making sure your students have their books. And then if you have a need for childcare, being able to offer that as much as possible to our students, those are all ways that we try to break down some of those barriers that many of our students face. 
I wrote so many little key notes and, and key points that you said uh, here. One of the things that I, I really enjoyed, not only because, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the webinar, I think about serving students holistically, mm -hmm. and it really sounds like OCC is thinking about it that way. They're thinking about how do you serve your students holistically? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned the data is great, but the data at the end is not as impactful as, as the data now. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Children's Learning Center, uh, and I talked about my experience as a community college student, but a lot of my family has gone to community colleges. And one of the big ones has been childcare. I recently had someone who couldn't, uh, in, a, in the family who couldn't find childcare, and it was a good enough reason for, for her to be like, I just can't continue. Mm -hmm. uh, so how you connect students to the resources that already exist is key, which actually leads me to, to the next question, but you've talked so much already um, but uh, about this really, but I'll, I'll still serve up the question in case there's other things that, you know, maybe you'd like to cover on that. But what do you really, what do you think is needed to pivot from enrolling? We talked about the enrollment cliff and the enrollment challenges that we are facing, but really to think about serving because, you know, your job as, as, as the Dean of Students is to think about supporting the student holistically, ultimately, obviously, with the end goal of completion. Mm -hmm. um, and how does that, uh, so how do you pivot from enrolling to serving? And how does that equate to value for both students and the institution? Sure, great question. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I, I'll be very open and share I myself, a proud community college graduate, um, Pasco Hernando Community College uh, down in Florida. Uh, great experience, um, good people there. It's really what helped me get comfortable with higher education. And they did well by me by not just looking at me as a number, but by being kind and having a good, for lack of a better phrase, customer service mentality. They, when we're able to serve students, when we look at meeting them where they're at and providing them the support that they need to be successful, we are enrolling. We could focus on just enrollment, how many students we have in seats on any given day, and that could be our metric. And that's a great metric to review regularly. But once we have them in those seats, what are we doing to support them? How are we serving them? Uh, a key component of that is that we there's a, nece a necessity, I'm sorry, excuse me, to provide creative ways to share the information, all of our resources, all of our available supports with them. As you mentioned earlier, uh, when it comes to cultural um, differences, cultural norms, uh, different populations, different levels of familial uh, educational experience, some individuals will be told or will have supports in their corner that say, you know what, it's really important that you go see your advisor, that you talk to them to make sure that you're on the right path that you go to tutoring because we want to make sure that you have the support you need not everybody has those supports naturally at home but not all students want to talk to the guy in a suit that it's looking for opportunities where we can get the information to them in a way that they'll receive it and understand it and uh, appreciate its value um, for us this is where our partnership um, really uh, really kind of helps us move the needle is through peer mentorship, we're able to have students talk to other students in a way that's meaningful and relevant to them in using language that they both understand so that they can fully appreciate the supports that we do have. Mm -hmm. So that type of peer-to-peer -peer connection uh, is incredibly valuable. There's the um, language that we use in a lot of our notification letters. Uh, if you haven't yet, I encourage you to take your financial aid notification letters, your housing uh, license agreements, uh, any sort of registration form, all of that. Put it in front of students. Put it in front of students who have no experience with higher education and see what they understand. See how much they take away from that letter, the legalese that's in many of the forms that we send out. Uh, it was eye-opening to me when I had a student reach out to me and ask, Dr. Scott, um, 
I saw your email about transferring. Um, everybody seems to be excited about that. What does transfer mean? Uh, it really resonated with me because I was talking in a way and using a language that that student didn't understand. Mm. So by using, you know, current students to help create uh, a shared language that's going to be meaningful and for your incoming students and for your continuing students, the better off they're going to be because they're going to truly understand what we have to offer. That's 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 fantastic. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, that really takes me into starting to, to pivot a little bit more into you guys as a, a case study here. Um, but, you know, Onondaga was a part of our inaugural uh, two year cohort uh, that we started. Uh, uh, I think it's actually two years ago uh, where we really saw, you know, great engagement um, and we capture some ex insights directly from students hearing what are the kind of words that don't resonate with you? What kind of issues are you having in financial aid? And we saw engagement really and support across all the different populations. And, you know, we know that research tell us, tells us that leveraging mentoring as, internet, as an intervention can have many positive outcomes, like connecting them to the right resources, but also things like sense of belonging. Uh, and we'll have an opportunity to dive deeper into OCC's uh, particular program here in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so, but before that, Scott, we i want to start where i feel like all good programs start before we can really think about uh you know starting a program you have to identify the population and the pain points for onondaga will you just walk us uh briefly through uh the the population on onondaga sure the um the high level kind of the stats are there um we have 7320 students as of last fall which is um, which is fantastic, uh, a great number. The challenge is that over a third of them are taking our college credit now or K-12 classes, where those students are taking OCC classes at their high school, taught by their high school teachers, and um, we're not experiencing, we're not accessing those students in the same way that we are the remainder of our students. So if you imagine 7,300 students um, a significant number of them are high school students. Uh, and then also making sure that we point out that our full-time to part-time ratio is actually the inverse of what I would hope for. I would hope that we're able to have more of a 60-40, um, 70-30 split full-time to part-time, but we are, uh, we are opposite of that. We are the inverse right now. Um, and then lastly, uh, First generation, 17%. Uh, that is grossly underreported. Um, we have over 60% of our student body labeled as unknown. Um, that's a data set that we are um, we just developed a, a plan to limit that underreporting. My understanding, my you know, best guess is that we're well over 50% of our student body is first generation, but with 60% being labeled unknown. That is something that uh, we're struggling with because we want to be able to provide services um, particular uh, and specific to different populations. And if we're not reporting them well, uh, we want to make sure that that gets repaired. Um, so that is something that we're focusing a lot on this year is making sure that that first generation population, is, as well as the underrepresented minority population that we have on this campus, is being well represented. Um, and then lastly, over to the right, for those who may not be familiar with the ALICE threshold, um, up into a certain dollar amount, I think individuals understand that there's a poverty level. There's, if you're below that number, you are considered impoverished. Uh, there are benefits that you're able to access. But if you want to actually uh, be able to cover all of your bills, um, meet all of your needs, and be financially secure, you need to be above, well above that that um, po the poverty threshold. Between that line where you want to be is called the Alice threshold. So if you look at those numbers, 62% uh, of our residents within Syracuse are below the Alice threshold. Uh, perhaps only 25% uh, 
of that population lives in poverty and receives certain community benefits, the remainder are struggling just to figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so those numbers there are really telling for us because more than half of our uh, region, more than half of our community is not able to pay their bills month to month. Uh, so anything that we could do to help support the community and try to uplift them to encourage, to provide them opportunities to achieve a credential, a degree, a certificate, uh, something uh, so that they can find a career, find a job where they're able to obtain a sustainable living wage. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the, the few things that I'd like to point out with this slide. Uh, I think you hit on quite a few things there, um, you know, thinking again, supporting students holistically, supporting those students that have uh, higher needs than others is going to be key. Um, I want to take a, a quick point of before we jump into a little bit more of, you know, some of the reasons that we decided to collaborate together. Uh, when we uh, when we met uh, with you all, you know, we you, you knew you had this program in mind, uh, but also you uh, were aware that running a mentorship program can be complicated. There's so many moving pieces from recruitment to training to tracking information, hearing what's going on in the relationships, who's facing what challenge. Right. And so a part of working with Mentor Collective and our approach is to walk every partner through uh, the right hand side of our six essentials, more or less of walking through that program design. Who are you so hoping to support with what, at what time, what intervention point is the right point? Uh, recruitment of mentors and mentees is just as much of an art uh, to get mentees on board and let them know about the program. Training, uh, especially if you're using near peers, uh, they need to have the right training in mind so, or the right training so they can be successful in guiding their peers. Matching, also uh, art, uh, you want to have as much, you want to have the mentees weigh in as much as the mentors weigh in to what uh, they'd like to have in a, in a uh, partnership. Uh, engagement support, someone's dropping a little bit, and assessment. Was the program ultimately successful? And that's part of the approach of Mentor Collective and what you'll hear Lauren walk through uh, for the OCC uh, partnership. Um, but in order, uh, the last piece I hit there was in order to define whether a program was successful, you have to define what those outcomes, um, what those measurable outcomes are, right? And we'll go through what that means for OCC and what kind of outcomes they defined as successful for them. Um, and we ultimately will find how successful a program is, is also by knowing the interactions that are happening between the pairs. Uh, a lot of the things are informed in this program by the pairs, what the mentors are putting, uh, what the mentors are logging in, what they're saying, their mentees, what kind of challenges their mentees are facing. And so part of, uh, of our work here with, with Mentor Collective is having them have an ability to self-report that data, um, have a way of uh, the program keeping track of it, and, and ultimately having them also report on their program assessments. How are they feeling about things like sense of belonging? Do they feel like they belong at OCC? And I know we're going to take a deeper dive, so I don't want to focus too much on that right now. Um, but I do want to hit a little bit here on the reasons for collaboration. Um, when we met with you all, Scott, I know that these were some of the the the, the key things that stood out, um, mm -hmm. creating that sense of belonging that I just talked about uh, to help students persist. Uh, but is there anything else that you would have that you would like to add for some of the reasons that you all decided to to join Mentor Collective? Um, obviously, all of the reasons we have listed there. Uh, one particular one that I'd like to highlight, if I may, is the uh, increase in administrative capacity. Mm. These are great programs. I, I don't think anybody has any uh, thoughts that peer mentorship is a bad idea. I, I think it's very much understood that there's immense value in this type of relationship. The challenge, and I've experienced this challenge previously, is trying to stand up a program on your own as a side project, because we all have so much to do day to day to then say, let's have a peer mentor program. Oftentimes, we lack the administrative capacity to see it to fruition or to do it as well as we would hope, um, as well as we would hope it uh, come along. The collaboration for us was incredibly valuable because there was work done between uh, our institution and Mentor Collective, but 
honestly, the heavy lift was done by Mentor Collective. We were able to advise, we were able to connect with students, we were able to do, for lack of a better phrase, the fun stuff, um, but the deep administrative work that needed to be done, we were able to hand off. So that um, increase in administrative capacity, that allowance for us to be able to trust that the product will be successful, that the um, outcomes will be what we hope, that the program will run the way that we know it should be run, was the value is incredible, and it allowed me to focus on other things, uh, the other list of requirements that I have to manage day to day. So all of them are incredibly true, but that's one that I truly wanted to highlight here today. Thank you. And that actually leads really well to me introducing Lauren, uh, part of your OCC team. Uh, and so Lauren, uh, I want to, uh, I, I want to kick, kick this over to you. Thanks, Yvette. Uh, hi, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lauren. I'm one of our program success managers here. And I've been working very closely with the Onondaga Laser Link program since inception. So I oversee all of our community college programs work to build the program design, implementation, scale, and do all of the fun administrative work that Scott just mentioned to make sure that our team can focus on students, right? Uh, so this is just an overview of our pilot year, which was this past academic year. Uh, and so the way that we run this program is we allow students with under 14 credits to sign up as mentees, and we have students with over 30 credits signing up as mentors, right? And our main goals and outcomes that we're measuring to are persistence and sense of belonging. So the idea being that we're using this program to create com community for students and allow uh, more interaction between them and more support. So earlier, Scott talked about holistic support for students across the institution, but also struggling with administrative capacity, right? Maybe there's not enough time to focus on uh, doing all the work that is required of a mentorship program, but there's a huge community on campus of peers that can provide help and access to resources and all of that stuff that we've mentioned, which is why we put this program together. So uh, the way it works is we do prioritize student agency and identity. So students tell us what they're looking for in a mentor and mentors tell us uh, how they identify and we try to find the best fit for mentees. That way from the get-go, they are connected with someone that they can relate to, right? But really wanna highlight that, you know, we're leveraging this community of students students who have been at Onondaga for a while, who know how to navigate that hidden curriculum, who understand where those resources are and can help provide that holistic support to students who are newer to the institution, while also allowing those mentors a leadership opportunity, right? Something they might not have had the opportunity to do otherwise. And you know, by extension, they're therefore then connected more to the institution as well. Uh, so I really like to frame mentors as the hinge between the institution and the institutional resources and the students. Uh, and Scott did mention also, you know, Onondaga has a very clear system of schools. So those smaller connections, communities within those schools, we do leverage that as well. So all of the success coaches in each school uh, have access to the program, are involved in the program, and can see what their own students are doing, uh, which is really helpful. So I know that mentors are able to, for example, uh, reach out to success coaches or share something that their students are struggling with. And then their success coaches can intervene directly with the students rather than the students having to reach out for that help. So really building out and leveraging the community that exists was the goal of the program. Uh, and we've been running this successfully for about a year and a half. So we're in year two as we speak. Awesome. So in our pilot year last year, we had really high mentee demand, which means this was something students wanted, right? Uh, and so really grateful that we saw so much interest, uh, but that did mean that we wanted to make sure we had enough mentors to match with students, right? So uh, this is a volunteer program and we do highlight that mentors get great leadership experience out of this, but in general, we tend to see more mentees sign up for programs than mentors. So something I worked closely with our team on was identifying strategies to increase the number of mentors that we can get volunteering for the program uh, to make sure that we can match students with a mentor that really fits their needs, right? And so knowing this is volunteer and knowing to Scott's point that a lot of students might be working full-time or have families and this might not be something that they're able to do, uh, we do 
emphasize that students can uh, choose the number of mentees that they mentor, right? We try to make this as flexible as possible for the mentors to participate and get that leadership experience. Ultimately, what we ended up doing uh, as well was opening this up to young alumni to increase our mentor pool as well. So uh, we did reach out to students who had recently left the institution within the past three years. And this, we saw a lot of interest, right? So way more than we were expecting, lots of recent grads uh, decided to come back and help mentor students who were looking for that support. And in a way brought even a more helpful insight into that transfer process that Scott mentioned, right? Helping to uh, really contextualize a lot of what's going on and share their own experiences. Uh, while ensuring that we had enough mentors for students who are signing up, right? And in addition, this also allowed us to uh, keep mentors, keep alumni, excuse me, invested in the institution. So often when students leave a two-year institution and they transfer to a four-year, they then see that four-year institution as their alma mater and sometimes forget about all of the work and all of the help that they received at two-year institutions. So this also allows uh, us to keep those alumni engaged, keep them connected to the institution without any sort of monetary uh, contribution, right? And then give back to their own community and continue to foster that sense of community. And actually with, with that note, um, uh, Scott, you know, what, what do you think that, what do you, what do you, what do you think there was, why do you think there was such a high demand for mentorship in that pilot year? I think creating connections is something that, you know, as humans, everybody's interested in. Um, depending on your level of introvertedness or extrovertedness, that uh, depth of connection may vary, but creating human connection is just, uh, again, just something that drives uh, most individuals. The challenge with the student group upon the onset of this pilot was that they had missed one to two years of school due to COVID. And I'm not one to blame COVID for everything under the sun, but they they did lose at least a year, if not more, of that social development, the level of social interaction that they would normally have had, where they would have had to interface with those who they may have disagreed with, where they may have been pushed to walk into a room that they didn't feel comfortable walking into. That developmental opportunity for those students disappeared. Uh, it's, it's not something that they experienced. Their interactions were with those that they had affinity towards, their friends, their family. Um, so creating a place where they could find a trustworthy ally uh, to come meet them at their level uh, allowed them a little bit more comfort so that they could ask the questions. Again, I, it's easier to ask another student, hey, can you tell me where the library is versus walking into the Dean of Students office to ask that question. So uh, there's, I think, a variety of reasons, but first and foremost, I think it's craving connection and um, doing so in a safe way based off of their uh, limited, again, social interaction and development uh, that had happened the, the one or two years beforehand that's i think that that's key they they wanted to create their own community they were looking for it they were seeking uh it for mm -hmm. it and i know that we have to to keep things going we do have to uh actually skip the slide so lauren i'm gonna bring it back to you here awesome thanks so this is just an overview of some of the metrics that we use to measure out towards outcomes right uh so looking at involvement and participation so in this uh 21 22 program we had over 400 students match with a relevant near, near peer mentor. And this was all like the halfway mark. So we had even more since then. And then about a third of them were highly engaged, uh, which is something we measure as well. So we want to see students actually logging those conversations, which is something that as administrators, you can see in the dashboard, are students talking? What are they talking about? How are they communicating? And feedback from students directly, which is invaluable. Uh, and then of course, like how many conversations are there? How are they communicating? Uh, and just making sure that engagement is high because we know that high engagement leads to, is a leading indicator of increased sense of belonging, of uh, increased persons, persistence, excuse me, right? So we really want to see that engagement between mentors and mentees in the program. And that's something that 
uh, we at Mentor Collective really help to, to facilitate by checking in with students and mentors and making it easy for them to share that information with us. Uh, so we do try to track to get every student to have at least three conversations with their mentor, right? So that's something that we measure directly to try and uh, make sure that students are engaged. It makes sense, right? After the first three conversations, that mentor is no longer a stranger. You've hopefully gotten to get to know one another, and now you can actually start to build your relationship. So this is part of why that's a key metric for us. We know over the course of running many programs across many different institutions that that correlation between high engagement and sense of belonging, increased persistence, uh, really jumps after that three conversation mark. Mm -hmm. So something that we talked about earlier was early intervention. Can we be really intentional and aggressive about intervening early where possible? And how can we do that, right? Uh, so part of this program is built in what we call FLAGS, which is a really useful early intervention tool for our student success coaches in each college uh, and for other administrators working on the program. Essentially going back to what I mentioned before about mentors acting as that hinge between the institution and the students that they're working with, this is something that allows mentors to share back directly with Onondaga challenges their students might be facing. So Scott and others working on the program at Onondaga will receive an email and see in their dashboard when a mentor flags something for one of their mentees that is outside of their purview, right? So that could be housing insecurity, financial difficulties, mental health struggles, uh, whatever that student might be struggling with, the mentor can say, hey, my student mentioned this, can you reach out to them directly? and uh, follow up. So this, you know, removes the need for the mentees to face their fear of, as Scott mentioned, going to the dean or going into whatever office they might not have gone to before and asking for that help. They can instead talk to their mentor about it, which they are more likely to do. It's a peer, right? And the mentor can actually access that help for them. So this is something that we've been using over the past year and a half. And uh, has, we've been doing a really good job of follow up and the coaches have been involved in this really closely so that coaches within those colleges can build good relationships with the students as they continue to help with any early interventions that come through. Great. And in addition to those flags, we also have conversations. So I mentioned earlier that mentors will go in and share when they've had a conversation with their mentee. And when they do log that conversation, it's a short survey where they tell us what they talked about, how they uh, had that communication, right? Was it video chat, text message, whatever it may be? And this really gives us a good idea of what students are focused on at what point in the academic year, right? And so this high level data here that you can see an example of on this slide really allows us to understand what resources might be most useful to students at what points in time uh, in addition to those flags, right? So what trends are we seeing? What resources can we encourage mentors to recommend to their students in these conversations to make sure students are using accessing the resources that are available to them so they're aware of what is actually uh, available to them on campus, right? So that they can take advantage of that. Right. And so these are a few examples of some real quotes from students in the program about their experience so far. Of course, qual quantitative data is really important. And as Scott mentioned earlier, we want to know how many students are persisting, how are they feeling about sense of belonging, how many students are participating or engaging. Uh, but, you know, it's also really important to hear from students directly, and that qualitative data is equally important. So knowing that, a uh, quick question for you, Scott, within your role at the institution, how important is getting that balance of both quantitative and qualitative student insights, and how are you using those? Uh, as dean, a lot of times I have to support students when they're not at their best. Uh, it could be uh, a number of challenges that the students are facing that I'm helping them through. Seeing this type of data, seeing this type of qualitative note really reaffirms the fact that we're moving in the right direction. So it's not just a feel good you know, comment, it's it's justifying the value of the program. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's also important to say that when we're actively getting these uh, these qualitative notes throughout the semester, it's allowing us to reassess that student's trajectory, excuse me, trajectory. Um, Going back to what I said earlier, we don't want to use lagging data. If all I did was look at these quotes at the end of the semester or at the end of the year, the data at the end of the semester or the year, um, it would help me improve the program for future years. 
but those students wouldn't be as well served as they could be. So being able to regularly get qualitative and quantitative data really helps us keep the program on track. Thanks for sharing. And in addition, so, you know, these flags are early intervention tool. We rely on mentors to share what mentees are struggling with so that Onondaga staff can then reach out, provide the resources to address those problems that they might be bringing up. But we also have uh, assessments that we use throughout the program that uh, assess non-cognitive factors. So in addition to conversations that students might be having with their mentors, we also want to understand how they're feeling about their sense of belonging and their academic self-efficacy on campus. So we do send these out three times a year to measure over time. We can see all the way down to the nitty gritty and then trends as well and overall in terms of how mentors and mentees are feeling. And this is another tool that's really useful for early intervention as well, right? So in this case, you can see maybe a student at the start of the semester uh, had a four out of five out of sense of belonging saying, okay, I do feel like I belong here, but for whatever reason that goes down to a two in the future, you can follow up with those students and see exactly what those responses are. So without, maybe they don't bring it up to their mentor, maybe it hasn't come up in conversation, but in the surveys, you notice that they don't feel like they can complete what they're being assigned, or they don't feel like they belong on campus. You now have this information to follow up directly, right? So in addition to those flags and the, the conversations between mentors and mentees, you actually also have access to these non-cognitive factors. How are students feeling, right? How are they feeling about those two things that are really important for their success at the institution? So going to those, you know, focusing on lead, uh, not focusing on the lagging indicators, but rather the leading indicators, these are leading indicators of success at the institution that we can now follow up on uh, using the information that students are providing to us directly. I'm gonna move quickly through these. You'll see them when we share the deck. These are just some of the outcomes from those assessments that we uh, sent out last year and really useful to see that the sense of belonging and uh, academic self-efficacy over time seem to increase for mentors and mentees, which is exactly what we like to see. Uh, and over time, students are feeling more supported, feeling more uh, that they can do what they are assigned to do on campus, that they have access to the resources they need to succeed. You can keep going a bit. Sorry about that, Lauren. Uh, Scott, I, I did want to ask this question here. Um, you know, what would you like your peers to take away from today's conversation? It's this entire program. It's wonderful. It's a safe and accessible resource for students. Um, financially, it's uh, quite valuable as an enrollment tool. Um, if you're able to justify that you're retaining five students, that you have your return on investment. Um, so definitely it's an, an affordable, reasonable uh, tool that we could use that is quite powerful. And in the way that you develop cohorts, that's done at a campus level where you get to decide what cohorts are most important uh, for you. If you want to spend time focusing on patent, excuse me, partnering uh, first generation mentors with mentees, uh, mentor and mentee links via academic program, so on and so forth. Uh, it really is customizable in that way. So I, I do think that this is well worth it. And again, that return on investment is significant. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And oh, I tried to click, sorry, a little bit technology <laughs> of an issue. Um, you know, as part of that, OCC was a part of uh, Mentor Collective's inaugural two-year collective uh, to gain some of those insights and allow us to do some of that. So, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted you all for Community College Month. And since uh, that initial conversations with you all, uh, this, this collective of two-year institutions has continued to grow. Um, and we're so happy to have you all be a part of that. I... I want to ask the next question, but you'll have to raise your hand for that. If you want to connect with us uh, to learn more about how you could scale your mentorship efforts at your institution, if you're able to raise your hand on the re uh, on, on Zoom instead of the poll, that would be great. Um, we can go ahead and capture that and uh, be in touch with you. And then I did I have a, we have a few minutes open here for for Q&A uh, and 
I want to see what questions we have. So if you just bear with me, I'm going to try to get those and or if anyone would like to come off mute and ask their question while I look for others that may have come in through the chat, uh, we can try to address those right now. No questions? Yeah, there were a few hands that went up. So um, I want to be sensitive to that. Was it? I don't want to call anybody out. <laughs> if you do have those questions, you can definitely come off mute. We don't bite. We promise we can answer those. Uh, they can be directed at Lauren, Scott, or myself. Um, but if not, that, that that's perfectly fine. That there's a question in the chat from Judy for Scott. Uh, what partnerships has OCC established with academics to meet in the middle to assist students? So referencing the insightful ground up top down comment on sure. the hierarchy of needs. Sure. Um, the what we've done here is student affairs is actually infused within academic affairs and academic affairs is again infused within student affairs. Our school's model, the uh, current model is that the specialist is a faculty member. The um, advisors and navigators are student affairs staff. They share a, an office space and they work together to create the environment where students feel uh, that they have this home. Um, more globally, I share a suite with the academic deans on campus. So what I do is interface with them regularly to make sure that if I'm seeing trends, that I'm bringing it to them. If there's concerns in the classroom, that I'm bringing it to them. Uh, that if I see that there's faculty who haven't raised uh, or completed one of those progress surveys, I'm following up with them so that we can make sure that everyone supporting the students from whatever angle uh, has been kind of placed in front of them. So uh, it's a very intentional connection. Again, it really is just proximity. We are sitting together at the table. We're sitting together in the suites. Um, we work well, we play well. Uh, it, it's a very, very good relationship that's been developed over these last couple of years. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for answering that question. Uh, and with that, we are actually at the end of our presentation today. We want to thank you so much for being able to join us for this past hour. I hope that this has been informative. I, actually, I know it has. Uh, Scott shared a lot of good nuggets. So thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, we hope that you'll join us again soon. Take care.